Have you ever been in a situation that you felt that you were unqualified for? Has there been times in your life that you wanted to make some important decisions and you wondered for days if it would be the correct one? All of us from time to time feel like we're not up to the task or able to handle the things that come our way. We seem to look at others and they seem to be doing wonderful and you seem to be always in a rock in a hard place. And when it comes to your spiritual life, it's not much different. Reading your Bibles and having a constant prayer life is hard for you. You want to be more consistent, but the pressure of life wears on you. And what seems easy for others seems to be a struggle for you. The question boils down to this. Have and can you really please the Lord and continue to function in this godless work environment and maybe in a difficult home environment? I want you to think about something. Maybe we have been asking the wrong questions. Somewhere along the way, we have been led to believe in a performance-based God. I want everybody to look up here just a minute. Because when the Lord gave me this message, I knew that this message could be easily misunderstood. And I knew that if I did not explain this correctly, you're going to take the wrong approach to this. So I want you to listen very, very carefully And so that when you walk out of here, you'll have no doubts what the intent of this message is. But here's what I want you to understand. Sometimes I believe that we believe we have to function at a top level because we believe we have to, watch this, we believe we have to perform in order for God to love us. All of our lives, we base everything we do on performance. At school, if you're you're good... In, in the elementary school, then you got a gold star on the wall. Here in, here in teachers have used all kinds of disciplinary measures just to get their kids to understand that it's better to obey and better to understand what the teacher is telling you. So we all have all, at an early age, We've all learned that we've got to be in our place and we've got to mind, we've got to pay attention and we've got to make sure that we get our star on the wall before the day is done. Are you, are you listening this morning? And I'm not so sure that as Christians, we've not let that follow through in our spiritual lives. Now think, think about this. There may be something that you've been missing in your spiritual pursuit that could really make a difference. What if you could learn something that could open up a brand new relationship between you and the Lord this morning? If you're trying to serve the Lord based on your performance, on your past successes, then you will become frustrated and you'll never feel worthy of the Lord's blessings. So much of what we know about the Bible has been handed down to us, like some traditions that you were brought up with. And your traditions carried over to your home. You learn early on that if you did the chores... You were rewarded, and if you did something right at school or at church and Sunday school, then the teachers would call you out for it. Now, we understand here at, at the church and in society and Christendom in general that there's nothing wrong with working hard because the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 8, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and it's worse, worse than an infidel or worse than an unbeliever. In Genesis 3.19 it says, In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread till thy, till thy return to the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, and dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So we understand that work was designed by God for you. But many have worked for many years, and you understand that, but someone said it like this. My grandfather once told me there are two kinds of people, those who did the work and those who take credit for your work. He told me to try to be in the first group because there's less competition there. That's probably good advice. A sign in a store window said, No help wanted. As two men passed by, one said to, one said to the other, You should apply, you would be great there. Uh, somebody will get that here in just a minute. Bottom line, we all realize the importance of working, but when it comes to something important, you need to see this. The following truths could assist you in a better understanding in your relationship to Christ. 
Now, I want you, if you have your Bibles this morning, and if you don't, it'll be on the screen. In Acts chapter 2, I want to bring a very, very important truth, and you're going to see it in these verse. Acts chapter 2, if you stand with me and look at these scriptures. Go ahead, Brother Chris. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2 and verse number 21, if you will. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 21. Notice what your Bible says. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you self also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it is not possible that he should be holding of it. We'll get to that here in just a minute. Father, we thank you, Father, so much for what you're going to do for us and the truth that you're going to allow us to see. And Father, I already know that it has pricked my heart as the prep and a study time that you have given me. And Father, I would just pray that I would say those things that would absolutely be needful. And Father, that you would erase from my mind those things that don't need to be spoken. Father, for these that have come in this room hungry to hear your truth and hungry to see and experience a new dimension of their spiritual life, I pray that they'll find that. Lord, my prayer all week long is that we would come and experience the Jehovah God of heaven. Father, the one who died for us and buried for us and was ro risen three days later so that we could have everlasting life. I pray, Father, that this would not be an empty, vain service that when we leave this place, we can honestly know that God has been in the midst. But Father, if everything we do here this morning, if you don't show up, it'll be just sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. Father, we just pray for an outpouring of your support, and your love, and your guidance. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This sermon that we just read to you, part of this, in this uh, short verses, was preached in Jerusalem. As thousands of Israelites were gathered for another feast, Peter stood up on the steps of the temple and began to speak into this crowd, many whom weeks earlier had demanded that Pilate crucify Christ. Peter's words were sharp and right to the point. And here we learned that he got his truth across. It was said, what he said was of grave importance. As a matter of fact, just as many in this crowd were incited to crucify Jesus, Peter's words that day could have well incited another riot. But notice what he went on to say. And this is so crucial that you get this because I think it is something that we've missed in our spiritual lives. Acts chapter 2 verse 36 if you will. Acts chapter 2 in verse number 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know us surely. Now Peter's speaking here. That God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now watch this, watch. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The word pricked here means to pierce thoroughly, to agitate violently. So the things Peter had to say to this huge crowd affected them. The center of the Jews' religion was built on a system of beliefs, many rules and ceremonies. In order to achieve forgiveness, they had to do all of the customs of the scribes and of the Pharisees, which would make verse number 37 so important. And if you don't catch anything else this morning, I, I, I trust that you will get a highlighter and pen and mark this. In verse number 37 was so important, and the Holy Spirit put this in our canon of Scripture, and He says these words. These men actually said this. Men and brethren, look at the question they ask. What shall we do? Why would the children of Israel need to do anything? After all, they were part of God's chosen nation. The males would have been circumcised, they offered sacrifice, and they tried to keep the laws. But don't miss this. The first sermon ever preached after the resurrection was delivered by a Jew, Peter, to a Jewish audience. 
And the main point of his message was that everyone, listen, Jews included, must trust Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Here's what you're saying. But preacher, we already know that. The problem is this. Each day, you try to earn God's favor. You try to do works. Try to work as hard as you can to solicit God's blessing. You try to make sure you earn your gold star for that day. But is that really what New Testament Christianity is all about? Is that all that I have to worry about every single day? Is that when I wake up, that I want to do enough for God so that I can earn that gold star, so He can put it on my attendance chart, and so that I can feel good about my efforts? I started thinking about that very hard this last week. And I'm not so sure, listen, I'm not so sure that Christians in general have got into a false concept that that's all we have to do. All we have to do is just work enough, try enough, because all we want to do is make sure, watch, we want to make sure at the end of the day that God still loves us. Now, now wait a minute. As I started thinking about that, there has, there, there's something that rang in my mind about that. Something that just did not seem appropriate right there. So you mean to preacher that all I've got to do is worry about at the end of the day to worry about if God still loves me and if I'm still worthy and if I'm, if, if, if I do all of these things, then maybe, maybe, maybe at the end of all of my life, then maybe heaven's my home. Somewhere in our culture, we have really sidestepped the main issue. We live with a system of do's and don'ts. And when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, we are sometimes too intimidated to really form a bond that will relieve our doubts and fears. Because like too many of the Jews, we are trying to impress the Lord by our do's. Listen to me. The point we need to be aware of is this. Are you trying to please the Lord by your labor or are you trying to please the Lord by your love? Naturally, there are things that the Lord expects from us. But you don't earn His favors. That's what the Pharisees and scribes were all about. We don't earn His favor. That's what grace is all about. The Lord loves you more than you can even fathom. During the days of His his presidency, Thomas Jefferson and a group of companions were traveling across the country on horseback. They came to a river which had left its banks because of a recent downpour. The swollen river had washed the bridge away. Each rider was forced to ford the river on horseback, fighting for his life against the rapid currents. The real possibility of death threatened each rider, which caused a traveler who was not part of the group to step aside and watch. After several had plunged in and made it to the other side, the stranger asked President Jefferson if he would ferry him across the river. The president agreed without hesitation. The man climbed on, and shortly thereafter, the two of them made it safely to the other side. As the stranger slid off the back of the saddle on dry ground, one of the group asked him, Tell me, why did you select a president and ask his favor? The man was shocked, admitting he had no idea it was a president who had helped him. All I know, he says, is that some of you on your faces was written the answer no. And on some of them, on one of, on President Jefferson's face, the answer was yes. He had a yes face. So the point is this. Beloved, I, I want to tell you this. I don't have to work towards my salvation. My salvation has already been accomplished. Christ has got one of those yes faces, and I don't have to worry about all of these stars that I'm trying to earn on this chart of mine. Jesus Christ says, listen, preacher, listen, young man, I love you, and you can't do any more for my love than what, than what I've already given you. You can't work enough. You can't do enough. You can't do all of this. Friend, he loves you just like you are. For listen, I'm talking about a God who loves you. A God who, who, who gave His life for you. A God who, who, who loves you so much that He was willing to bear Mount Calvary's cross for me. In other words, He says this, I love you. And here's what I'm afraid of. We have heard that all of our lives, but I don't believe it's ever sunk in. You bec- because we're so intimidated and because all of the messages and all of the lessons and every Bible readings we hear, 
we, we, we come to the point of this, that I must do, I must do, I must do, I must do, I must do. But beloved, can I tell you a, a, a secret that you need to understand? You don't do, it's been done. And Frank, can I tell you, I understand what you're thinking, and I was thinking the same thing when I was getting this message. But preacher, there's some things that God expects from me. Yes, there's some things that God expects. He wants you to be faithful. He wants you to be diligent. He wants you to be in His Word. He wants you to be at the house of God. All of these things are, are non, non-negotiable. You know this. But I'm telling you, from day in and day out, we just get this mentality that I've got to do so much for God. I've got to do, I've got to do, I've got to do. And because you can't ever measure up to your own standards, some of you have been frustrated when it comes to your relationship with Christ. Because you've set a high standard in bar and you come in at the end of the day and you're miserable and you're grumpy and you're hateful and you lash out. It's why? It's because you just had one of those days to where it just ended all days. You didn't have one of those yes faces. You didn't have one of those faces that would draw people to you. You just had one of those experiences like none other. I want you to understand this and listen to me. In 1 John chapter 4, in verse number 19, it's so simple, and you already know this, but I think it needs to be repeated. The John was writing here, the apostle of love, and he says these simple words. We love him because he first loved us. Now, some of you, some of you, if the truth would be told, be told, you might not be so lovable. If the truth would be known, probably your dog don't even like you on some days. But aren't you glad Jesus isn't like that? Where's Brother Kyle? Brother Kyle and I was talking about this a week or so ago. And I want you to hear this. Because when I heard this, I, I kind of rebelled against it still, until I started pondering this. And, and it just ate at my spirit for a week. And I heard this. So listen to this. You can't do nothing. That God doesn't love you. And listen, wait, 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 don't, don't, listen. And God's, listen, listen. God's plans for you has not changed. Wait, 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 Listen, when I say God's plans for you have not changed, listen, I don't care how big of mistake you have made in your life. I don't care how bad you've blown it. And I don't care if you've disappointed your, your grandma, your daddy, your preacher, uh, your spouse, your children. I don't care. Listen to me. I want to tell you this. God's will for you, listen, has still, is still in place. Because here's what he understood. He understood exactly who you are. And you can't do anything to displace his will for you. But preacher, I've disappointed. I understand you've disappointed the Lord. I've disappointed the Lord. I've done some things that I wished I would have never done before. But here's what I know. His will and his plan for my life is still originally in place. Is anybody getting this? His will for my life is still there. But preacher, you don't understand. I've made a mistake. Yes, I know you've made a mistake. But you can't work enough. You can't do enough. You can't outdo this. I'm telling you, some of you in this room need to accept the grace of Jesus Christ. Let it wash away your sins and get busy in the thing that God has called you to do. I believe I'm the only one hearing that. I can't mess up enough where God's plan for my life is still not intact. Wow, what in earth is, I'm just telling you, from the foundation of the world, God still knew me. And he still knew the stupid things that I would still continue to do. But here's what he told me. He said, young man, let me just tell you this. I still got that plan for your life. Yeah, but God, you don't understand. And this is how we are. This is how we are when we talk to God. Yeah, but God, I've made a mistake. I've done this. I've let this point. And you don't, no, 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 no. He says, I still got that plan for you. And I still expect you to walk in the way that I've told you to walk. But many of you in this room, you're still waiting for your gold star on the wall instead of living by grace. And I want to tell you this. I want to tell you this. If Baptist ever figured out grace living, it would change the way you think. It would change the way you view the world. And it would change the way you think about church and your relationship with God. You see, we, 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 we let other denominations steal the thing called grace. 
I still believe that's important. I still believe that grace is important in our relationship with Christ. Aren't you glad that He saves us by His grace? Amen? It's something that we did not deserve. It's something that He freely gave us. Now, I don't know about you. I didn't deserve it. But thank God I got it. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 6. Very quickly, I'll try to hurry. Notice what it says. To the praise of the glory of His grace. Oh, I love that. Wherein He has made us... Watch this. You don't need to miss this. He has made us accepted in the beloved. To be accepted is one of man's greatest psychological needs along with our spiritual need. Our need to be accepted by other people is nothing compared to our need to be accepted by God. People go to extraordinary lengths to gain the acceptance by those they admire. But listen to this. God does accept us. And the reason is the phrase, the beloved. He accepts us not because of our own special prayers and promises, not because of our resolve and efforts to be good, but because Jesus Christ is in heaven and He is our beloved. And if you tap into that, my friend, you'll have a new dimension of your spiritualness with Christ Jesus. You'll have a closeness than you've never had before. Before the world was ever formed in the eternal halls in heaven, it was determined that Jesus would give His life. And listen to this. And when we accept Him as our Savior, it is complete. First Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18 says it this way. For Christ also hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Now watch this. That He might bring us to God. Now wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. That He, Jesus, might bring us, take us to God. We're not worthy to do that, but through Jesus we are. Being, listen, being put to the death in the flesh, but quickened or revived by the Spirit. And friend, that's what Jesus' bottom line, He's trying to teach me. God now sees us in His beloved. He looks at us and sees Jesus. No angel among the heavenly host has more acceptance than you. God placed this, listen to this, God placed us in His sight in such a way that we can be perfectly accepted, perfectly at home, and perfectly at ease. Right now, you are in the Beloved if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior. Somebody will get more excited than that. That's pretty good stuff. Our acceptance by the Father in the Beloved is to the praise of the glory of His grace. God's glory is enhanced by the grace He has shown to us. It was His idea, not ours. It was His plans to save us, to, listen, to seek us, to sanctify us, and to seat us in His glory. The reason why so many feel trapped and miserable all the time is you cannot wrap your hands around this principle. If performance-based religion was a way to heaven, then why would Jesus come to die for us? If all we would have to do is live by some moral code, then Jesus could have sent us a code instead of a Savior. Wow. There was someone in our Bibles that simply could not believe that there was a God who offers grace instead of guilt. Judaism was built on, on guilt, but Jesus came to offer us grace. Look, if you will, quickly at Luke chapter 18, verse 18. We'll try to wrap this message up quickly. Luke chapter 18, 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, you know this story. Here we go again. Oh, oh, oh. Don't, 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 don't miss verse number 18. Watch, watch. What shall I do? Now, wait a minute. Here is a, here is a, the Bible calls him a certain ruler, but here is this influential young man coming to Jesus, and he's essentially telling Jesus this. What do I need to do to get all of my gold stars on the wall? What do I need to do to make you love me? And what do I need to do to make me accepted in your sight? Is anybody following this? This is what he's asking Jesus. Look at verse number 19. Ah, Jesus, aren't you glad? I love Jesus. What, what, what's what he said? Jesus cut through all of the, the nonsense and he says, Okay, you want something to do? You want something to do? Let me just give you, let me throw out some things for you to do if that's the, if that's the, way, you want to, if that's the way you want to view things. Why callest me thou good? No one is good save one that is God. Now watch this. He was saying this. All right. You want something good to do? Young man, I want you to understand that nobody is good. But Jesus. he says, yeah, but God, I, I get all of that. I understand all of that. But look at verse number 20, 21. Jesus again. 
He was telling him, oh, uh, uh, he says, all right, you want to do these things? Then do it in the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he says, I love this, all of these, Jesus, I have done. Jesus, you don't understand. I have mastered these commandments. In verse number 21, he says, I have done these from my youth. Jesus, I'm not... Oh, I love this part. Watch, everybody watch, 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 watch. Jesus, I'm not here for a sermon. I'm here for my gold star. I just want you to tell me that because I'm being so good, and because I sat in my chair when Miss Alanis told me to sit down and shut up, I've done that. And she gave me a gold star. I want you to, listen, I want you to tell me that I've done everything good because I have mastered these commandments. Can't you picture Jesus just listening to this guy ramble? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, come on. Can't you picture Jesus listening to us ramble? Can't you picture Jesus hearing all what we say? Yeah, but Jesus, I made a mistake. Yeah, but Jesus, you don't understand. Yeah, but Jesus, just give me your gold star so I can go on about my life. I've, I know this church thing, and I know these sermons, I know these songs, and good heavens, don't you understand? I've, I've, I've mastered all of this stuff, Jesus. Okay, okay, okay. You, 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 you've told me that you have got these commandments down pat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Give me, let's, let's get on to something else, okay? And here's what Jesus says. Then sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Ooh, that's what verse number 22 said. Jesus heard these things and said unto him, You lackest one thing, sell all that thou hast, and go give it to those that don't have it. Now, wait a minute. Here's what he's saying. I want a gold star, but I don't want it that bad. Now, wait a minute. Here's what you're thinking. What does selling everything and, and, and doing all that, what's that got to do with what you're talking about, preacher? Well, I'm going to get to that because it's crucial that you get this. See, this guy thought he had everything mastered. This guy thought he had everything going his way. But there's something, Brother Chris, keep that up there because there's a phrase in that verse that's a key to this whole story. And many times when you read this story, you never see it. And listen to me this. Jesus did not come to earth to die a sinner's death to give you a gold star. Jesus came to earth to give you grace. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What, 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 what's all that mean? Well, here, here, bottom line is, Jesus has given you something you don't deserve. Wow. Well, what do I don't deserve then? Well, do we have time for that? You certainly don't deserve His salvation. You certainly don't deserve His love. You certainly don't deserve Calvary. You certainly don't deserve the blessing. I could go on and on like this, and here's what He's telling you. And this young man thought about all this. Man, I've mastered the commandments and I can't do any more than I've done. I've got all this stuff down. Boy, I'm a good guy. I just want my gold star. And Jesus says, sell all you have, give to the poor and, and do those things. He said, man, I don't want to do that. But let me show you this. Here is the bottom line of this whole story. It wasn't his wealth <laughs> Jesus was after. Jesus was after his heart. You see, by that statement alone, Jesus knew that his heart was far from him. Here's what he knew. He says, son, if you do all that stuff, that's fine. But that's still not the main point. The main point is come and follow me. The truth that you need to hear this morning is many of you trying to work for your star on your, on your board to get recognition. You want your plaques and awards and all Jesus is saying, why don't you quit thinking like that and why don't you just follow me? Because let me just tell you this. If you follow me, everything else is going to be okay. If you follow me, that, that, that thing that you're worried about this morning, the thing that just presses on your heart, the thing that you just can't get over, it's going to be okay. If you just, if you concentrate on those words right there, young man, come and follow me. You see, this guy had a performance-based religion. And it carried over to his life. And I'm not so, I'm not so sure that Calvary Baptist Church members don't have a, have a performance-based religion. We think we gotta do, we gotta do, we gotta do. Friend, listen, you don't do anything. God's done it. He's given you grace. He wants you to come and follow me. The main point this morning is not so much of what you have done. It's not so much what you have accomplished. Jesus says, follow me. Today you have the opportunity to receive one of life's greatest gifts. A gift so worthy that it cost Christ his life. Your frustration can leave. Your trying to measure up can cease. And 
you cannot do anything for God to love you anymore. Listen to this. You are a child of the King. And He extends His grand invitation to you right now. And the songwriter said it best when he wrote these words. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Mount Calvary's mount outpoured, there was a blood of the Lamb was spilt. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Come and follow me. Father, we thank you for the time we've invested in your kingdom. Father, I'm not so sure that we have tried to perform our way to heaven instead of trusting in God's grace. We think that everything, spirituality, depends upon what we do rather than what Christ has done. Father, this morning, it's not about me. And it's not about anything I can do. But, oh, sweet Jesus in heaven, it is about you. We have missed the point. We have missed the very essence of our spirituality. Well, preacher, if I do enough, if I show up enough, if I'm faithful enough, no, 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 no. Jesus says, come and follow me. Come and follow me. In this day, followship is way down. Our good works are way up. What are you trying to impress Jesus with right now? Are you trying to impress Him by your goodness? He's looking at our hearts this morning and say, just come and follow me. Father, I know a message like this can be taken so wrong and out of context. Yes, there are some things you require but Father if all we're trying to do is just do and do and do and do and do and and not realize what you've done then we're going to live sad defeated unproductive lives Jesus says just come follow me put all that nonsense away and just have that relationship with me because if you do that then all these other things will fall into place I wonder how many would just dare to trust God and come and follow Him this morning. Maybe you need to be scripturally saved. Maybe you need a church home. Maybe your heart's been out for the last several months and weeks. Maybe there's some things that you've been doing that you know in your heart that's not right. And this morning, God has convicted your heart and says, why don't you just follow me? Why don't you just trust me to lead you in the right way? Why don't you do what you know you ought to do in following this morning? Father, I pray in all of this room size this morning that you just take over. Maybe you would heal a heart, repair a home, bring forgiveness, bring deliverance. Father, whatever you need to happen, I pray that this old altar is open and that you would do what you need to do. Would you stand with me all over the room? Would you come and be obedient to the Word of God as you come this morning? As you come.